Welcome to Nobilis Erotica, the best science fiction and fantasy erotica anthology podcast in the known universe. This month, Alien Tragic Sex. This is episode 474. I am your host, Nobilis Reed. This episode of Nobilis Erotica is sponsored by the generous patronage of Nobilis Erotica listeners. To help out paying the authors and voices that create these stories, visit patreon.com slash nobilis. This month's patron-funded story is Biohazard by Victoria Frost. Victoria writes queer romance and erotica, sometimes with aliens. She lives in the Pacific Northwest with her girlfriend, her girlfriend's angry one-eyed cat, and a longing for the mountains. Read more of her work on Smashwords. You can find a link in the show notes. Our narrator, Eleanor O'Brien, is the artistic director of Dance Naked Creative, a writer, performer, and facilitator. She is the creator of solo shows Plan V, The Joyful Cult of Pussy Worship, How to Really, Really, Really Love a Woman, GGG, Dominatrix for Dummies, and Lust and Marriage, as well as the Inviting Desire Ensemble Production Series. She has produced and directed the community cabarets What is Erotic, Revelations, and Sex We Can, and is the founder of the Biennial Sex and Culture Theater Festival, Come Inside. She hosts the monthly erotic open mic, Stand Up Smut, and teaches workshops exploring the intersection between sexuality and creativity. She holds an MFA from the University of San Diego, Old Globe Theater. Here we go. Biohazard by Victoria Frost, read by Eleanor O'Brien. Although the junior adjudicators liked to go out for drinks after work, it didn't mean they weren't as boring and pretentious while lounging in the mixed quarter and drinking galactic drinks as they were in the Hall of Justice. Uel sighed, sipping her drink, and gazed out over the bar, watching Mahelian and humans avoid each other, or very occasionally mingle. To her surprise, at the bar she spotted a familiar jawline. She waited until the woman turned. It was her. Last week, a human murderer had been brought to face Mahelian judgment. He was accompanied by two human guards, one a male in a bulky jacket and gloves, and the other a young female with a strong jaw and watchful eyes, showing no sign that she felt the Hall of Justice's usual chill. Usually, there was little reason for humans to enter the Hall of Justice. They had their own courts and took responsibility for the behavior of their own citizens. But in this case, the Maeller clan concerned was not satisfied with human justice, and the humans felt enough distaste for the situation that they allowed the transfer of responsibility for the prisoner to the Maheller adjudicators. Monsters, the prisoner spat at the size of the Mahelian. Uel sympathized with his pain. His sister had died horribly, and the Mahelher had caused her death. However, as an adjudicator, Uel was wary of thinking that the Mahelher was at fault for her death. Yes, he had infected the girl with his symbiote, but she didn't know the circumstances of their liaison, and neither did the murderer. Had the girl claimed to be on antimicrobial pills? Had there been an unfortunate accident with the tool the humans called a condom? Or had the Maheller been one of the ugly and cruel, who reveled in the power given to them by biological accident, the ones who intentionally spread death with their seed? But the two principal parties were dead, and no one was left to answer those questions. The male guard reached for his paperwork and fumbled his grip on the prisoner with his bulky gloves. The prisoner raised both his fists and pounded them hard onto the man's lower back, and then he grasped the guard's weapon and leveled it at Uel. He was screaming something about the disease, the real disease, Mahelian, but she couldn't hear him. Uel could see nothing but the blinking black hole of the human's antiquated projectile weapon. And then? It was gone. The female guard tackled the prisoner. The gun went off, cutting through the flesh of the woman's arm and embedding itself on the frescoed ceiling. She'd saved Uel's life. 
I finished my drink, Uel said to her companions. I'm going for a refill. Her table hardly noticed. Good, because Uel had a nearly full glass. She slipped down the balcony steps and slid onto the stool beside the woman. It's my hero, she said brushing her fingertips over the prison guard's hand. The woman startled, glancing up at Uel's face and then at her own hand, where Mahel her fingers had brushed. The flinch that followed was almost a full-body recoil. Abruptly, Uel remembered why her touch might be unwelcome and drew her hand back. I'm sorry. No, said the woman too quickly. You're from the hall. I'm glad you're all right. Uel smiled awkwardly. Mahelian were usually careful with touch, but a life debt washed away formality, and she owed this woman a life debt. What's your name? A look of surprise. Then curiosity. Kieran, the guard said. Kieran Hajegari, you're an adjudicator. Her eyes flicked to the clan badge Uel wore and widened. Your adjudicator Nakwa, Uel grinned. Junior adjudicator, don't go giving me a promotion to make it sound like you saved the life of someone important. The way Kieran's face twisted up made it clear that both the idea Uel wasn't important, the clan Nakwa was not exactly a low-status clan, and that she would brag about all this were both so deeply offensive to her that she didn't know how to protest. And I would really prefer if the hero who saved my life called me Uel. Uel, unable to help herself, it was the life debt, obviously, touched the bandaged wound. She was very glad she had not had to see this young woman bleeding out on the floor. This time, Kieran did not recoil, just eyed her fingers bemusedly, Embarrassed, Uel drew her hand back. It was my job, Kieran said. I was ready to respond, and I responded. Training does that. We're trained in a lot of ways, Uel said. More humans than we would like to admit agree with the prisoner. Mahelian are a disease, a plague upon humanity. We infect you. We kill you when we try to show you affection. That hate could have trained you to step the other way when my life was in danger. The prisoner's violence had shocked her, the rawness of his hate. She had never feared humans before. Perhaps that was arrogance. The symbiote made Mahelian stronger than most humans, healthier, able to survive on worse food and fewer nutrients. But hate was a powerful force. Mahelian were stronger than humans, but they were not bulletproof. Kieran looked insulted. That's not how it works. I'm a biologist by training. You aren't monsters or predators or even venomous. Your biology is just different. And humans should know better than to put just any old thing inside their sex organs. She rolled her eyes. But humans will be humans, regardless Though curious why a prison guard was a biologist by training, Uel didn't pause. You say we're not venomous, even though our poison comes through our snake? (laughs) Kieran choked on her drink and snorted. She'd probably never expected a Maheller to make a sex joke. She was right. Most Maheller would never stoop to such low humor. Uel noted that Kieran had a pad with her, the screen displaying some rather dense Maheller equations. Oh, what are you studying? Kieran ducked her head. I'm studying up for my entrance exams to the Science Congress. Uel hesitated. She was reasonably certain that humans did not operate their own Science Congress. The Maheller Science Congress? Kieran stiffened. My area of interest has to do with the interaction of human and Maheller systems, and the Maheller Science Congress is more advanced on the topic than human labs are. It would be the best place to make a contribution, and I feel that I could contribute, if they let me in. 
Luelle drew back her tongue, but could not hold it. You really think you could keep up? Science is science, Karen snapped. Your symbiote may make you stronger and healthier, but it doesn't make you measurably smarter. I'm just as qualified for this as any of you. Luelle shifted to the side of her stool. I wasn't implying. Yes, you were. Don't worry, Karen's shoulders slumped. I've been doing this long enough that I'm used to it. Uel wondered how long Kieran had been trying to get into the Science Congress. She felt guilty for what she said. A thousand excuses came to mind. She just meant keeping up with the language, since Congress business was not conducted in trader or cultural issues. But in truth, she had simply repeated the prejudice that humans were not as intelligent or well-educated as Maelians. She had no excuse. I'm sorry if my fellows have not treated you with the respect your intellect is due. Kieran gave her a narrow-eyed look. I should say that everyone deserves respect, regardless of intellect. But I appreciate you acknowledging my superior mental powers. The light sarcasm of the response made Uel feel better and free to tease. Honestly, it's not fair, she said. You're a highly trained physical specimen and a competitive intellect. On a second peak, what Kieran was studying was the third round of Science Congress entrance exams, meaning she had passed first and second rounds, classifying her as a higher intellect for a Maheller as well. You outshine us all, Kieran shook her head. Then, from the floor of the bar came screeching, Biohazard! Biohazard! Get out of the bar! What are you doing here? The crowd had peeled away from a sturdy-looking man in a turtleneck, but his turtleneck had come down just enough to reveal the harsh black markings of the biohazard tattoo on his neck. Uel froze. She hadn't seen one before. A human who'd been infected with a Mahiller symbiote and survived. The survival rate was under 2%. Most died convulsing, brain fever, the inability to digest any solid food, their immune system no longer able to recognize their own blood as not a threat. It was an ugly death. But the ones who survived received the benefits of the symbiote the same as the Mahelian did. They also received the curse. They could spread the disease and infect other humans. To keep them quarantined, Anyone who survived was branded with the Maheller symbol for biohazard on their neck. It was almost absurd that in this mixed bar, where half the populace carried the symbiote, that it was only the human carrier who was reviled. But it wasn't simply the disease he carried. It was the knowledge that he had lain with a Maheller. He'd likely taken a Maheller Maohif into his body, and received a deposit of their infected seed. He was not just the embodiment of the disease, but the perversion that led to it. I'm just trying to get a drink, the man gruffly demanded, but the cries were too wild, too strong. The sound of the human militia outside made him retreat. He was not welcome. Uel found her breath rate increased, her pulse high at seeing him and his marking, it shook her, but not as much as that had shaken Kieran. Kieran was wan and her hands quaked. Are you all right? Uel asked. Kieran gulped the last of her drink, but it didn't seem to settle her nerves. Kieran, without thinking, Uel reached out, touching her forearm, and Kieran jerked back, recoiling so hard she nearly threw herself off the stool. I'm sorry. Uel put her hands behind her back. How insensitive was she? She was the carrier. These poor, weak humans. She had to be careful. Sharing drinks, getting injured near them, even poorly washed hands might be enough to send them to their death. But then Kieran dropped onto her elbows, hanging her head. I'm sorry. I'm just... My dad, she said. My dad was trying to find a cure. But... A vial broke in his lab. A fucking vial broke. Nicked his finger, let the symbiote in. He died. 
died horribly. Uel didn't know what to say. How unfair. That was what she felt. But saying so sounded childish. She didn't expect Kiran to say anything more. Then she lifted her head, fixed Uel with an uncertain but intense gaze. Do you want to go somewhere else? Somewhere else? Turned out to be a few blocks away at Kiran's apartment. The space, up some narrow stairs, was small and dingy. Uel wrapped her arms around herself and sat on the edge of her chair. Kieran poured them both more drinks, and Uel held hers gingerly, not wanting to drink it, but not wanting to leave Kieran alone. Kieran didn't say anything, just drank her drink and kept shooting Uel strange looks, quick, sharp, intense glances, unnerving ones. Uel tried to think of something to say, but it was hard to comment on the decor of the apartment when there was none. And it was hard to look away from Kieran and her strange, intense gaze. The woman was pretty when she smiled, but she might be classed as beautiful when she was unhappy. Her dark eyes were liquid and deep, and with her dark hair and smooth skin, she glinted with anger and discomfort. Uel could smell her in the apartment, deep in every fabric, thick in it. I've been on antimicrobials for months now. The word startled Uel, said abruptly, flatly, as if they'd been having some silent discussion. What did Kieran mean by saying so? She wasn't saying she was xenosexual, was she? I thought I'd try to finish my dad's research, and I didn't want it to go the way he did, so antimicrobials. It made sense. It was the scientific thing to do. But getting them... Kieran shook her head, her hair scattering like tassels across her face. You have no idea. Going into a clinic and asking for the antimicrobial prescription? It's sexual health. They're not allowed to ask you why you want it. But the way the nurses look at you, they treat you like you've already got the biohazard tattoo on your neck. They treat you like shit. And fuck them. Fuck them. If it wasn't like running a fucking gauntlet to get the drugs, people wouldn't be dying at the rate they are. Their attitudes are killing people. They are killing people. That's terrible, Uel said softly. She never thought about the experience of humans who chose to risk their lives for sex. But her adjudicator's mind saw clearly that this was wrong. You did not punish people before they committed a crime. And you did not punish people for trying to prevent disease. Yet she'd felt relief to discover that Kieran hadn't gone on antimicrobials because of sexual reasons. Even she felt disgust at the idea of Kieran lying back and spreading for a Mahalia Mahalif, that she could want to have the most dirty kind of sex, the toxic kind. So I didn't tell them it was for science. Fuck them anyway. Every time I go back, they make you be seen for every 30 pills. They look at me like they're wondering where I've been. But I'm looking at the other people there. Some of them have Mahalian waiting outside. Lovers who care about them enough to walk them to the clinic and make sure they get their medication. Others, they're just stubborn. Knowing what their desires are and, and being safe about it. And then there's me. Kieran lifted her head. The wry irony in her words, also in her eyes. I think you're the first Mahaler I've touched. Humans keep their hands to themselves, but I'm protected. It's not a hundred percent reliable. Touching her so casually had been a mistake, Well realized. She hadn't understood how humans were always wary, always watchful. I have condoms, too. Well froze. That? had not been where she expected the conversation to be heading. The pretty human was looking at her, intensely, flushed and uncertain, and determined. What? No, Well protested. I thought about it, but it wasn't a real thought. But then you kept flirting, and I just... Flirting? Well had been flirting? But all of the touches 
seeking her out. Of course, it read like flirting. Well had never imagined wanting to touch a human intimately. Yet Kieran's intensity, the proposition, like a physical thing in the room. She felt her cheeks heat up, her mahalif throb, arousal. She knew her belly was pink, and she could see in the curious and heated way Kieran looked at her that her arousal was not a secret. Do you want to fuck me? It was a quiet, almost tired question. But there was hope in it, and also desperation. Kieran needed this for some reason, for grief or exhaustion or confusion. I don't want to hurt you, Uel said. It was shameful that it was all she could say, but she knew her truth. Yes, yes, she wanted this pretty human under her to touch her body and know it, but she didn't want Kieran to die because of it. That horror was too strong. I'm as safe as I can get. It's still not safe. Kieran laughed roughly, a moment of tightness releasing before winding back up again. <laughs> but doesn't the risk turn you on? It has to be good, right? People wouldn't risk death for mediocre sex. Kieran was drunk and grieving, but she was beautiful. Well found it hard to think. Her arousal opened her senses to the scent of Kieran, the taste of her on the air. She felt her moif tighten, her shot of shao grow liquid. She was so aroused. How could she not be aroused at the prospect of slipping inside someone willing to risk death to encompass her? But how could she say yes to this? How? Kieran didn't wait. She set down her drink and climbed into her lap, her body lanky and awkward, and she kissed Uel. Uel kissed her back. She was careful, wary of opening her mouth, wary of an exchange of saliva, even though saliva rarely carried traces of the symbiote, even though the antimicrobials should handle that with ease. But the human squirmed on Uel's lap, and Uel gave in. She cupped her face and licked roughly over her lips, and Kieran's lips came apart. With the first touch, the first exchange of fluids between their mouths, Uel came undone. Sex was never smooth and simple and purely erotic. Uel had never lain with a human, and Kieran had never lain with a maheller, and confusion and embarrassment were to be expected. And yet, even with the awkward stops and starts, Uel's bewilderment, what do you mean you don't have a moif? Kieran's responding bewilderment, what, all Mahelia are hermaphroditic? It seemed they had made their decision. Kieran took her moahif in her hand, amused by its size and shape. <laughs> it's furry, Kieran said, barely holding back her laughter. And upright, like a puppy's. Those are cilia, Uel protested. And what else would it do? Do humans hang down? How embarrassing. The condom was a strange, uncomfortable second skin. But Kieran was a flushed, warm, snug space. Human shaharashau were so different from Maheller ones. When Uel had been taught the art of copulation, she had both sent her mahuif into the liquid space of the shaharashau and had her own shaharashau invigliated. But she remembered the shaharashau as gelatinous, but open a space made for the mahaif to unfurl inside. But inside Kieran, it was not only the pressure of the condom that made unfurling difficult. It was the pressure of all the muscles inside her human, keeping her close and contained. When joined, she tried to unfurl, and Kieran gasped, wide-eyed, catching her around the shoulders, her hips bucking up into Uel's. 
humans thrust. Humans urged each other towards intense peaks. Mahelian unfurled. Mahelian stayed joined as an act of meditation. Together, Kieran felt the sensation of an unfurling. Together, Uel found strange joy in urging her partner to an intense peak. Kieran squirmed and gasped, and her convulsive spasms urged Uel's own release, never considered the goal of Mahiller copulation. And yet, when twined with Kieran, unbearably pleasurable. Uel knew then that Kieran was right in her hypothesis. This weakness, this perversion, this bestiality, as some would call it, it made intraspecies sex pale by comparison. There had never been anything as intense and satisfying as this. Perhaps the filth of it was part of the appeal. Uel felt a strong urge to violate the human, to see her own deep blue-green seed dripping out of her. She would never. There was risky and there was risky. When she oozed thick inside the condom, her mind lingered on it, and the shuddering moan Kieran let out was enough to make Uel wonder if perhaps she was thinking of it too. They didn't stop there. Uel lazily marked out every part of her human with her mouth. This is what it is to love an alien, these funny creatures, so much like them, but not. This was what it was like, to change condoms and hold Kieran's hips against her bed and push into her as she squirmed and wriggled and pleaded because she wanted it deeper, kneaded it deeper, and Uel pushed deeper, spreading her wings to hit the right spot, and Kieran went limp and melty like caramel under her, and yes, this was good enough to risk death for. This was that good. Uel didn't expect to see Kieran at the Hall of Justice in the week that followed, but another transfer of prisoners Another strange overlap of human and Maheller jurisdiction. And there she was. Uel did not greet her. It was too much of a risk. No one could find out what they'd done. Acknowledging her would be dangerous. But ignoring her made Uel feel sick. And seeing her. Uel hadn't wanted to think about how worried she'd been. It shouldn't have bothered her. Kieran was on antimicrobials. They'd used condoms and changed them often and carefully. But she had tasted every bit of Kieran's skin and thrust roughly when she couldn't bear the intensity of it anymore. Kieran had felt so good, squeezing her tight and her moahif aching and half numb from so much use could at least act the bludgeon. Kieran was here. She was fine. The incubation period could be up to a week. The next human brought into the Maheller court was escorted by different guards, and Uel couldn't breathe all day. That evening, she banged on the door of Kieran's apartment. Kieran opened it wearing sweatpants, holding a half-eaten slice of pizza. She blinked at Uel, bewildered and concerned. I just wanted to know. I need to know. You aren't sick. Kieran looked at her. Her expression taut, uncertain, then it resolved. She stepped back from the door as if welcoming her. I'm not sick. That word, the slow rumble of Kieran's evening voice, the way she smelled clean and earthy and like pizza. Can I come in? Yeah. This time, it was almost one movement. Uel stepping in and pushing Kieran up against the wall. Uel's body pressed hot against her. Her mohif roused and ready, and there were condoms and discarded clothing, and again, and again, and again, Uel lifting her hips, leaning over her and groaning as Kieran gasped. Put it inside me. Put your disease inside me, Kieran muttered. The ugly thought made Uel's throb and ache to unfurl knowing that only this 
thin barrier of latex, the biomods roaming Kieran's bloodstream, were all that kept Uel's seed from seeping into her, infecting her, poisoning her. The risk made Uel want to do it again and again. This wouldn't be the last time Uel knew. She'd show up again, quiet, so the neighbors didn't realize what sort of visitor Kieran had, lured by risky sex and Kieran's dark, intent eyes. Then she would have this again. Have Kieran letting Uel fuck her until she slumped exhausted into the pillows, body slick with sweat, and her shahishau swollen and glistening with her own mess. And still, Uel knew that would not be enough. That even dazed and half asleep, Uel would want to cup her cheek and gaze down at her vulnerable little human, her bruised mouth and limpid eyes, and fill her again and again with venom and ghosts. Uel's mind drifted in an adjudicator's meeting to Kieran, those dark eyes and the lazy way her body lay in sweaty sheets after their copulation had come to a close. Uel would slip into her shower, clean it with harsh chemicals afterwards, then half-dress herself and join her, talking lazily of work and family and home. After a few times the risk, the shame, the fact that this joining could ruin both their lives faded in importance. They were consenting adults, taking precautions. They didn't need to live their lives in fear. One night, Uel's condom split with her still half unfurled. She felt it go, felt the sudden onrush of direct sensation and went white in panic. Her moahif contracted involuntarily and her fingers went thick and fumbling, ungracefully trying to withdraw from Kieran without spilling all the condom's contents inside of her. It's fine. I'm on antimicrobials. It's fine, Kieran repeated. But Uel's panic was too high to hear it. This arousal, the erotic thrill of chasing death, it was a fantasy. Kieran shushed her and soothed her and showered, then made her come to bed, holding her there as if the nearness of her body could somehow assure Uel that she hadn't poisoned her. Uel couldn't sleep. When Kieran drifted off in her arms, warm and soft and delicate, like a baby Jokorno, like a meepling, Uel could only stare down at her, aware of how much she didn't want her human to die. Kieran didn't even get a cold from the exposure. The antimicrobials worked. And though Uel told herself that she would stop, that she would give this up, staying away was too hard. She couldn't ignore Kieran's quiet, searching smile, her casual chatter. Humans did not practice the twelve arts of conversation. The warm press of her lips, not sexual, simply an intimate form of greeting. Once her door was closed, Uel loved her, she realized one day but she could never really have her. Even with every precaution, the heller human relationships could only be seen as prurient, perverted sex. It was reckless thrill-seeking. It was careless. It could not accompany love. Any indication that their relationship was sexual would be stigmatizing as the biotazard tattoo, even though they were smart, even though they were careful. It wasn't fair. As an adjudicator, she knew it wasn't fair. She could have argued her case with ease, but it wasn't a law, it wasn't a code, it was just the way people were. And there was nothing she could do to fix that. It was hard to love this human, to love her, and know that they could never follow the three paths of joining, sliding easily into each other's lives, each other's days. It was hard to ache to be with her, and no, they could not be together. It was hard to feel that the pleasure of their intimacy could be worth anything at all, so it would have to end. Uel began the slow, sorrowful process of ending it. Their evenings had become less frequent as Uel pulled away. Kieran seemed busy too, and it had been nearly a month since their last brief meeting, an unexpectedly chase encounter at a yogurt shop, 
sitting together and laughing over their different yogurts, the human cow's milk and bacteria, and the Maheller draconoroke milk and symbiote, both pasteurized to safety, hesitantly tasting one another's, absorbed enough in conversation to not notice the odd looks they received. Uel had begun to wonder if that day had been the end. But tonight, Uel had received an unexpected summons from Kieran. She wanted to rejoin with her, but also knew it was time to speak the formal words of leaving. When the evaluations for senior adjudicator began, she could have no secrets. It was better to end things cleanly than let them fester. Uel retraced her steps to the small apartment. Tonight, the stink of Kieran was strong there. It seemed it had been a few days since Kieran had performed her usual meticulous cleaning regimen. Thanks for coming, Kieran said, her voice rough like it had been on that first night after drinking too much, on that second, in the evening, after pizza. Of course, knowing it had to end didn't make Uel love this human any less. Kieran wrapped her arms around Uel's shoulders and held on. Uel embraced her as well. The nearness and warmth of her strangely unarousing, but the more intimate for it. Her closeness, the clasp of her arms, made Uel ache to hold her in the third way, to offer her more than she could ever give. Then Kieran pulled back, just a little, enough to look her in the face and smile a wry, dirty grin. Hey, beautiful. It was one of their bad jokes, their codes. Noel smiled back. That's the pot talking to the kettle. These human sayings meant little to her, except as a practice intimacy that made traders sometimes feel dearer to her than her own language. It was the wrong response, of course. She should have taken this chance to say the words of parting, but how could she not remind Kiran just how lovely she was, especially on a night like tonight, where it seemed she needed comfort? You want to? It was almost embarrassing that that was enough. Uel's arousal moved her moahif, and Kieran reached for it. They tussled a little, Uel not quite ready for Kieran to know how turned on she was at half a sentence and a smile. Then Kieran was pressed against her, catching her mouth in a kiss. More kisses than bed. Uel had Kieran out of her shirt, her hands pleased by skin and the firm curves of muscle, Kieran tugging at her clothes, their bodies against each other, skin to skin. Uel played her fingers along the opening of Kieran's shahashau, still mesmerized by how strange and sensitive she was. She could make Kieran orgasm from the touch of her hand alone. If that was the only sex they had, they would have always been safe. But it was not the only kind they had. Kieran's hand found her moahif still bare, though the arousal had already let it begun to seep moisture from its cleft. It curled around her hand like a familiar friend. Wait, Well murmured, let me. She had condoms. Even though she hadn't planned to go so far tonight, she was a demon for always carrying condoms now. A fellow junior adjudicator trying to borrow a stylus had nearly put her hand in the condom packet on her bag, and Uel had panicked and yelled at her, embarrassing them both. Why not just once without? Kieran grumbled into her shoulder, her hand working under Uel's mahif without hesitation. We've had enough accidents to know the antimicrobials work. The first split condom hadn't been the only one. Uel was shamed for her rough and urgent movements. No, it is an unnecessary risk. I want to feel you. Kieran's voice had a grate of desperation over it. Once. I want to feel you just once. Uel had nothing to blame but her own desire. She was aroused and Kieran was willing and her mohif strained against the human's hand. Just once. Just once. Once, she'd unfurl completely inside her. Just once, she'd have the fullness of pleasure between them, her cilia caressing the tight passage. Just once, she'd have all of Kieran before she had none of her. 
her moachif convulsed in pleasure as it touched the heat. Slick tightness clutched around it. Kieran squirmed and grasped as it slithered inside her, hotter than she was. It must feel like a wriggling fireworm, the moahif's cleft growing wider with wriggles of the long cilia, the shorter ones on the outside sparking as they touch skin, the electricity not diffused by the latex. Uel lost herself in the sensations, in the urge to feel all of her, to send spasms through her, to make Kieran orgasm around her over and over again, to unfurl inside her. Human sex was often quick. Macheller lasted hours. Theirs had always fallen somewhere in between, the long, slow, intimate penetration, and then the final plateau of orgasm. This, this had the intensity of human sex, and the duration of Mahler. This kept them tangled, tight, sweaty, and grasping through rough, ungainly kisses. This became, for a little while, the whole world. Spent and exhausted, Uel withdrew, and that sight she'd imagined, Kieran dripping with blue-green symbiote thick seed. There it was, running with it smeared with it, on her belly and on both thighs, her sheet stained, mattress marked with disease. Kieran, her weak human, had passed out. She slept, snoring lightly, her body marred with filth, shamed by her own lack of self-control, afraid, revolted. Uel fled. A few days later, Uel saw the announcement of the new intake for the Science Congress. Kieran's name was not there. Suspicion trickled down her spine to sit sick in her stomach. Kieran would have found out before the announcement. This had been her third attempt. No fourth attempt was allowed. Talking to her, knowing her, Uel had stopped doubting that she deserved to join the Congress. She was so smart so thoughtful and curious. This wasn't fair. She would never get in because they didn't care about her worth, simply her species. Kieran would have known that. She would have known her fate the night she called her Maheller lover to her and asked to be taken with no protection, asked to be filled with the disease that killed her father. It hadn't been a spur-of-the-moment urge. It had been a choice. Uel hadn't seen her for nearly a month before that. There would have been no reason to battle her way through the ugly looks of the nurses to fill her antimicrobials. There was no reason to run to her. If Kieran had done what Uel had thought she'd done, it would already be too late. But still, she left the Hall of Justice, not even halfway finished with her shift, not answering any calls from fellows or full adjudicators, in her ceremonial robes of justice, shaming them by breaking into a jog, by sprinting across the streets and hurrying down the alleys in the mixed quarter, she made her way to Kieran's apartment. Up the narrow stairs, down the hall, she beat on the door. No response. She fumbled, searching for the key Kieran had shown her was hidden there. She opened the door. She smelled it first. Sickness. In the bed, she saw Kieran's narrow back, racked with coughing, empty wretches. The bucket beside her was half filled with ooze, the top only yellow bile. Her skin was sallow, her eyes bloodshot. She lifted her head, blinking vaguely at Uel, then slumped down again into sweat-soaked sheets, unrecognizing. Oh, Kieran. The words were useless, instantly soggy in the fugue of sick in the room. Had Uel's pulling away spurred her to do this, in addition to the blow of a final rejection from the Science Congress? Or had Kieran felt the same way she had? The meaninglessness of their connection made holding on to it more painful than pushing it away? It didn't matter. There was nothing to be done. And yet she would be here. She would witness. Uel moved to the bed and settled on it, tucking her robes around her legs, the Maheller adjudicator drew the broken little human into her lap and held her there. 
she stroked down her back, murmuring soft, soothing noises, and though her body quaked with involuntary chills, Kieran seemed to relax. Maybe she felt a little better. That pleased Duell a little, but in the end, she knew it wouldn't matter. A 2% survival rate meant death would come, quick and sure. But if she could do anything to help her, she would do it. Nothing mattered but this small human curled in her lap, ensconced in a nest made of ceremonial robes. What did they matter? The symbol of Mahela justice, when they had so unjustly rejected Kieran from their Congress. But in the end, it was not her people at fault for this mortal situation. It was herself. Her love had poisoned Kieran, and so Uel would hold her until she died. And that's our story. This coming September, all supporters of the Nobilis Erotica Patreon campaign will get an ad-free version of the podcast. You won't have to skip ahead to avoid my reminders. Patrons at the $3 level will receive monthly bonus content, which currently consists of The Hallowed Covenant, a kinky post-scarcity BDSM novel by Eunice Hung and Franklin Foe. In addition, remember to pick up Monster Whisperer Second Class in your favorite ebook retailer or on the Riverdale Avenue Books website. Your support will help make sure this series continues. You have been listening to the Nobilis Erotica Podcast. The music is composed and performed by Mass Relay. This podcast is released under a Creative Commons attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives license. Until next time, listen hard.